Well, hello, New Life Church. Glad to have you joining us here on day 15 of our 40 days of prayer as we're starting this year with uh, hundreds of other Alliance churches that are having an emphasis on prayer. Our, our daughter, Diana, seemed to never see a baby animal, actually almost at any point in her life, even to right now, when she's 30 years old, but when she saw the baby animal, she didn't want it for a pet. We've had dogs, we've had cats, guinea pigs, gr African gray parrots who could talk and, 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 uh, and mimic what we would say. We have had hamsters, we've had rabbits. We drew the line on goats, even though she asked numerous times for goats. Probably close to a hundred times over the years, we would see a puppy or we would see a kitty or when we lived in Africa, we would see like a small little goat. And Diana would look up at me with puppy dog eyes and she would say, Dad, can you give me a horse? She was one of those kids who had heard the suggestion that if you, if you ask for something big like a horse, maybe you'll be able to talk them into giving you a kitty, which is what they wanted in the first place all along. We would laugh together about this and it's become really quite a family joke. The, the young child trying to coerce or manipulate or hound the parents for a pet that eventually the parents give in to the request. Sometimes we did, but probably about 98% of the time we didn't. The last time that we gave in though, she was 23. She was home visiting us, uh, felt like we needed a cat. We were at a garage sale. She saw free kittens for sale and she said, Dad, can we get a cat? So we got a cat. She's never cleaned the litter box. She's never fed the cat. It all fell on Nancy and I. We can sometimes live as though God is like one of those parents whose kids are trying to manipulate and coerce and find the right path in to, to be able to, to, to back the parent, back God into a corner where God ends up saying yes to some of the requests that we have. We pray and we don't get responses to our requests, so we alter our approach. We try to figure out the angle that's going to convince God to give in. We make promises. We tell him we're sorry for sins that we've committed, thinking that maybe that's an obstacle for him to saying yes to something that we really think we need or something that we desperately want. And, and that by maneuvering as wisely and as carefully and as knowledgeably about God's personhood, as we can, maybe we'll win the day and we'll get a yes rather than a no or rather than a wait. In the grand scheme of things, I've become increasingly more convinced that there is not a perfect formula that, if followed, leads to positive responses to our prayers. God's ways in his perspective are just so much higher than my ways. So while I still find myself asking and still knocking on the door, um, with my requests to God, I frequently choose instead to submit myself to his great wisdom and to his will and to ask instead for patience for a situation that I wish was changed, but he knows I'm better off if it's not changed. I found that usually what needs to take place far more often is that I align my heart with God's heart for prayer rather than to discover the secret that will make him say yes more frequently. As I said earlier, we're 15 days into our 40 days of prayer, and today we're going to be looking at the line from the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6, verse 11, that simply says this, Give us today our daily bread. Prayer as petition, requests. So as I read some scholars, read some scholars' insights on this verse, I, I was reminded that, that this request comes directly after the disciples were taught to pray in the previous verse, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, after we tell God to, and I explained this last week, after we tell God to expand what is of greatest importance to your kingdom, do that in your kingdom, do that in my life, do that in my community, do that in this church, do that in our world. Um, after we tell that to God, um, then we follow up with, oh, and by the way, God, here's what seems important to me as well. Mm, aligning our thoughts with his kingdom should change how we go about asking for things that we think are priorities. We see God's priorities first. And then take a look and see if ours line up with that. I think God must shake his head and he must, if God rolls his eyes, he probably has rolled his eyes on hundreds of occasions 
um, with just me when the first words of my mouth as I pray to him are, God, I really need you to fill in the blank for whatever lies ahead of me that particular day. Jesus's prayer model starts with, God, ultimately, I want your kingdom to grow. Oh, and I think I need a few basics as well. Let me tell you about them. I read this week that only after we pray for God's heavenly glory is it right for us to pray for our, our own earthly good. I think the writer nailed it perfectly. So, let's take a look at this request. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us today our daily bread. The first word, give, it's an imperative. It means this is important, so do this, God. But here's our huge problem, uh, particularly in Western countries, uh, America included. Affluence or ease of life has conditioned us to live as though the basic necessities of life are actual birthright. They're just given. Of course we should always have our daily bread. We've got monthly bread sitting around. You see, true hunger Lacking the basic necessities of life, such as food, has almost never been a part of my human experience. I should take the word almost out of that. It has never been part of my human experience. Did you know if you take out your phone and, and you do a little uh, voice thing, voice question to it, um, and you ask the question, how many days has it been since the day that you were born, it will tell you. For me, I did it this uh, today, actually. In the 22,106 days that I've been alive, there has never yet been one day where I've been without food to eat. The closest thing that comes to mind was uh, really, I think, during our first year of marriage, um, when the bank account was scraping bottom and we were full-time students at Crown College with part-time jobs and finances were extremely tight. We had no credit cards at that point in time. And the refrigerator didn't have very much in it in our upstairs apartment in Chaska, Minnesota. But my prayer even then would have been much more along the lines of, God, give us enough so that by the end of the week, we're still going to be able to find food to eat in our refrigerator. And then we'd go to work as waiter and waitress and God would provide us money and tips and we'd have the cash right there. Our comfortable wealth masks this reality, even the most basic necessities of life are a gift from God. We forget that when we have so much. Everything that we eat is a divine gift. It's one of the reasons why we pray before meals, why I, why I still make it a priority to pray before meals, to, to, to with transparency and with honesty, to humbly acknowledge that only by God's goodness, by, by God's goodness to us, do we have enough. We haven't gotten here on our own. Don't be fooled otherwise by politicians or other slick talkers. Now, I want to confess that I haven't always been the most compassionate person that I could be. Having been raised with strong principles of personal responsibility, I'm still tempted to think that we should always be able to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. To look at some natural disaster on TV and smugly think, you know, many of those people could have planned a little bit better and they wouldn't be facing such dire, dire consequences. <laughs> then, this, then this summer, uh, I, I read a book that kind of opened my eyes just a little bit more to it. Um, it, it was a, a, a book about the, uh, the tornado outbreak in the little town of Emily, about 30 miles northwest of here, in 1969. Um, where several people were killed and many, many homes and lake cabins were destroyed. And, and many of the victims of that tornado were from the Twin Cities. They weren't residents up here. They were up here at their lake cabins. They were people like you and like me. Maybe they had a little bit more money than we did. Um, uh, but they were self-sufficient. I'm sure they felt like they were independent. They almost certainly valued high personal responsibility. And in less than five minutes, when the tornado just devastated so much of the landscape, so much got taken from them that they virtually all needed to rely on someone gifting them their very next meal. Friends, I come to this understanding, this realization. We are always just hours away from being in a bread line ourselves or needing to go to, go to a soup kitchen to get food that we need for our sustenance. Give us today 
our daily bread, God? Because we never truly can guarantee with 100% certainty that we'll be able to provide it for ourselves. This short petition is in many respects about humility. Adopting a posture in prayer that aligns with the truth that we are in greater spiritual danger when we have plenty than when we have nothing because when we have plenty we think that we don't need God. But we do. I don't want to find out what kind of person I would become if I remove prayers about my daily bread. Give, give us today our daily bread. How I've missed something about this verse for all these years is like beyond me. I'm reading it this week, a book that I have read in the past, and I'm rereading it. I'm looking and saying, oh, how did I not pay attention to that? How come that just didn't become in the forefront of my, of, of my mind? Um, author Phil Riken uh, points out that something as basic as a loaf of bread is rarely produced through the efforts of one person. Think about that for a moment. What does it require? Well, generally speaking, it requires a plow to plow up a field somewhere. It requires planting seeds. It requires cultivating weeds. It requires harvesting the grain. It requires grinding the grain into flour. It requires adding oil or adding yeast. It requires baking the bread. And most of those steps don't just require other people. Most of those steps require something else in addition to it. Somebody had to make the plow. Somebody had to make the combine. Somebody had to make the bowl for the dough mixture. Somebody had to make the oven that we cook it in. How, how dare we think that we are somehow self-sufficient? You know, we're looking at the Lord's Prayer from Matthew's version of it, which is smack dab in the middle of the, of the, the uh, Sermon on the Mount. But in Luke's version, it's a little bit different. Uh, Jesus is out. He's praying with his disciples when he gets done praying, they look at him and they said, Lord, teach us to pray, just like John taught his disciples. And Jesus' Jesus' response in this line of the prayer, when they say, Lord, teach us to pray, he says, give us today our daily bread. Here's what I've missed in this verse, if you haven't caught on to it already. It's in the plural. It's not give me today my daily bread. It's give us today our daily breads. I know, you might be looking and saying, big deal. Does it really matter? I think it does. Consider these two, two implications, all right? First, every time we ask God for bread, we are acknowledging not only our dependence on a benevolent God, but also our dependence on other people and their dependence on us. And we're going to get to that part in just a moment, all right? Virtually nothing arrives at our ta- on our table without the work, the sacrifice, in the gifts of friends that we know or strangers that we're never going to meet and a host of those people that we'll never be able to thank on the side of eternity. So we thank God instead. We acknowledge our dependence on God instead, who gives the strength and the skills to all those others to make it possible for that food to arrive on my table, on my plate. I've shared before that one of Nancy's favorite shows is Mountain Men. Um, it highlights people in Alaska and in Montana and I think maybe North Dakota who, who really just want to live off the land as isolated and independent as they possibly could be. And that's cool if it fits their personalities. I get it. looks like it's really, really hard, okay? Um, but even the most independent of them must acknowledge that they had to rely on somebody else's skill to make the saw that they used to cut down the wood for their log cabin. They have to acknowledge that they have to rely on someone else who forges the skillet that they use to cook their venison. Someone else mined the chemicals to make the gunpowder that shot the bullet that killed the animal that they're living off the land on. It just, it, 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 the list would probably be endless at how reliant we are on, to, on others right now and others before them who first had the idea of here's how you make gunpowder, all right? Um, so while they seem independent, these mountain men, and while they seem self to, self-sufficient, it's just on a different level than my level of self-sufficient, self-sufficiency, which means I'm actually 
in the same broad category of mountain men. I'm trying to convince my wife of that. I don't think she's fully agreeing with me. Uh, is, uh, but, but a second implication that I see in this, in, this, uh, in this word us is by praying for God to give us bread, we're also committing ourselves to sharing it when we get it. How could we honestly pray, God give us what we need this day and then withhold from others what they need for this day? Others who, as I just said, are dependent on the generosity of people like you and like me. So if we pray this prayer honestly, if we don't switch the words to say, God, give me my daily bread, but if we keep them the way Jesus said them, give us this day our daily bread, if we pray this prayer honestly, we must be willing to be part of the answer for other people who are praying this very same prayer. If we have a surplus, God is looking for us to say, how are you going to share that? Give us today our daily bread. When my parents were in their 80s, um, we would visit them periodically. We'd stay overnight, drive down on a Thursday after, after work, and come back on Friday evening because Friday was my day off. And, and, and we'd go and we'd stop in, and I'd rummage around in the refrigerator for something to eat. And invariably, I'd get frustrated because there was almost always something in the refrigerator that I had to throw away that had gone bad. There was a time when I think Dad had eight different types of ice cream treats in their freezer. One kind for probably every ice cream treat that they could buy when they went to the Aldi grocery store that they loved so much about five blocks from their house. I, 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 I've, I've heard recently and looked it up online and the figure online, I thought this is way, way too high. Um, that, but, but I've heard that as, many, that as much as 25% of the American food supply is wasted. Just thrown away. I think the percentage probably went down about 5% after my mom and dad passed away. It just seemed like I would throw away lots of food every time I was down there. Here's the scary thing, okay? The thing where you go, oh no, what's happening to me? Okay, before the kids came home for Christmas uh, a few weeks ago, yes, I went through our refrigerator and I threw away some food because I knew uh, they would give me grief if they found it in the refrigerator as well. I am becoming them. I'm becoming my parents, all right? So this is my point. Most of us are so well provisioned that we can't, can't comprehend a world in which our food for today is, an assure, is not assured long before we turn to the calendar page to January. Let me clarify. There are many instances in the Bible where people lived day to day. You're aware of some of them. Moses with the Israelites in the manna for 40 in, 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 the, in the wilderness for 40 years they would wake up in the morning and there was food in the ground manna it was called that provided the the food the protein that they needed for that day and they couldn't save any of it for the next day the next day they had to wake up and believe again there was going to be manna in the ground except they could save it on the next day the, the day before the sabbath all right elijah the prophet were told camped by a stream called kareth and his food was provided for him by ravens who brought bread and meat every day. All right. Later, when he stayed with a widow and her son in, the, in a, a town called Zarephath, the three of them lived on the edge every single day, miraculously having just enough oil in that widow's jug for just that day's bread. And even in the New Testament, in Acts chapter 6, verse 1, something I hadn't paid attention until this week as I'm as I'm reading and doing some studying and all, um, when it talks about how there, there were deacons that were in the church in Jerusalem that were appointed um, to arrange for uh, food for widows, it talks about how it was a daily distribution, which to me communicates that some of them needed food to eat. Every single day, they had to get extra food to eat from that distribution. That's how hard it was for some of those widows. In every one of these, these people's faith was just razor sharp, strong, vibrant, growing, deeply rooted. But that doesn't mean that planning for the future and building up reasonable resources is contrary to faith. In 2 Kings chapter 4, Elijah's, um, the, 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 Elisha, who, was, uh, who had Elisha, Elijah as his mentor, um, he was the channel through whom God miraculously provided enough oil for a different widow to have a steady stream of income just perpetually. 
she had enough oil to just keep selling it, and it just kept resurfacing in the, in the jugs that she had. And then Proverbs 13, verse 22 tells us this, a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. That's his grandchildren, all right? So that involves wise stewardship. It involves storing resources. It, it involves having resources at the end to pass down to the kids who will pass down eventually to their kids, all right? So, so the key is not to, um, to impoverish ourselves to never have enough for tomorrow and constantly living, uh, to be living on the edge. The key is, once again, in this, in this spiritual life that we, we are on, there's a journey that we're on, the key is balanced faith. Where we don't despair because finances are tight, but where we also continue to manifest faith in God even when our finances are healthy. And of course, when we have much, God is looking at us. He is looking at you in your wealthy situation. And all of us in America can be categorized by the, the word wealthy, or almost all of us. He's looking at you and he's saying, I want to see two things. I want to see gratitude for what you have and I want to see generosity to provide for what others don't have. Those two qualities need to have a firm position in our hearts. So give us today, God, what we need today. Back in the summer, I think it was in August, um, the Alliance District Superintendent, uh, Dan Scaro is his name. He stopped by for a visit. In a sense, Dan is kind of like one of my bosses. He is also my pastor, in a sense. And at the end of our time together, he said, can I pray for you, Larry? And I said, certainly, of course, I'd love that. And, and his prayer was essentially this. He said, he said something along these lines, almost exactly these lines. He said this, God, don't give Larry today anything that he doesn't need until tomorrow, because then he might be tempted to think that he doesn't need you tomorrow. Would you listen to that again? God, don't give us today anything that we don't need until tomorrow. Because then we might be tempted to think that we don't need you tomorrow. Finally, the last word in this short little petition that we're going to look at is the word bread. All right, Bread is referring just to food at its most basic level. That's the understanding of, this, of the meaning of that word. All right. Did you know that every culture in the world is, is known to make some kind of bread? Loaves of bread, crackers, bagels, dumplings, tortillas, and of course Big Macs. It's a big, basic staple of life. So let's not overlook something here. In this model prayer of Jesus, he says, stick to the basics. He mentions nothing about extravagance or luxuries. The prosperity gospel, um, with a host of televangel televangelists as their primary proponents, they are just recent distortions over the last several decades of, a, of our Christian faith. And they often say things along the lines of, God told me to believe for fill in the blank. And oftentimes what they're filling in the blank, I think is totally at odds with what God's heart is all about. They ask for luxuries. One was quoted probably 30 years ago saying, when you ask God for a Cadillac, make sure you tell him what color you want. I think God probably might have thrown up at that particular request. Frankly, I, don't, I, I doubt that God remembers telling them to pray along those lines when they say, God told me to believe for, fill in the blank, all right? These, many of them are charlatans, okay? I think they've got the, some of the basics of Christian faith right, but these men and women are confusing our needs with our wants. Author Phil Riken again has written this, our trouble is that so often we come to God with our greeds rather than with our needs, so. Listen to this. Much of our discontent is rooted in the desire of things that God has not promised and that we would often be better off without. So what? Let me share a few suggestions with you here at the end. All right. First, acknowledge with God that our comfortable lifestyle makes us less likely to be humble when it comes to our ability to provide for ourselves. So tell him that yes, you still are reliant on him to give in everything that you have, everything that you have, everything that you have ever had is only because he is a giver. My second recommendation to you would be this. Remember that little phrase, give us. 
So if there's anything that you can take from this, this uh, message today, from, from this petition, it's this. We, we pray in plural. We were taught to pray in plural. So ask God to reveal how you could give to someone who was truly in need and how you could be the answer to their either spoken prayer or unspoken prayer that is a burden to their heart. And be generous. Look for a way to be generous this week, even if it hurts, even if it's a sacrifice. And finally, um, the last suggestion would be this. Submit yourself to the priorities that God has for you and adjust your prayer requests accordingly. Being content if today we have enough for today because nothing about tomorrow is guaranteed. So let's be satisfied that today God has been enough and has given us enough. Let me pray. We get so much wrong, God, in our petitions before you. I am constantly focusing, and many, many others watching are constantly focusing on desires of my heart, wants of my heart. And if we focus on needs, I think you'd, you'd, you'd love to throw in some of those desires and wants as well. Um, but when you taught the disciples, you focused on what are the basics that they need. They need bread. And then there's also this aspect, God, of we, we, we take and we compartmentalize prayer into personal prayer, personal, individual, singular prayer, when Jesus taught about plural prayer. So if we're going to ask you, give us today our bread that we need for today, and then provide for us, um, in essence, we've been already asking you, give us uh, enough so that we all have enough and how, what does that look like when you provide a surplus for us God I think you're oftentimes wanting us to bless others as a result not to do so in a legalistic way not to never think about the future not to have our bank accounts be like bare bones zero all the time but that we would always have within our hearts an attitude of gratitude and and that we would possess generosity in great measure align our priorities with yours Help us to see that all that we have, God, is a gift from you. We can never manufacture it on our own. Thank you for all that you've provided for us up until this point and all that you will in the future. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us. I hope you have a wonderful week. God bless you.